Good morning. Good morning. I want to uh, welcome everyone this morning. Um, if you're looking around for notes, there aren't any. And uh, the reason there aren't any is because I had spring break this past week. And I kind of made an announcement toward the end of the hour um, last time we were together that um, I wasn't going to have time with different family obligations and stuff we had going on this past week to uh, prepare the notes like I normally would. And because of uh, the different scheduling and so forth. So I said we would have sort of like a QA. and a um, so that's a little dangerous. I don't usually like doing Q&A, to be frankly honest, because number one, I don't have anything definite prepared. So if the Q&A doesn't happen, and fa or if you guys don't have any questions, then I guess we're done, okay? Um, not only that, you know, going into a Q&A, you've got no idea what you might be asked, so it's virtually impossible to prepare uh, effectively. So I have my tablet here. Um, so I could make reference to some stuff if I need to get on the internet and look some things up or what have you. Um, but other than that, I didn't want to just cancel class uh, because I thought maybe some of you might have some questions and stuff uh, about what we've been talking about in this hour. Uh, we don't often have a lot of time for questions because there's just uh, so much material that I'm trying to cover in a given study. So um, I do have one topic that I would be prepared to kind of say a few things about, but I wanted to start by just sort of seeing uh, if anyone had thought about it and if you had any questions and just kind of start from there. So is it, did anybody uh, who, I know like Fred and Mike and, and, and uh, Sarah and Craig, you guys were here, Stewart's were here, uh, Donald's, Blake, you were here, and Fred, at the end of the hour last time, Brad, you had already left to... Um, to go out to uh, do greeting duties and stuff like that. So did anybody have any particular questions or anything that you wanted to ask or bring up about sort of what we've been going over or um, anything along those lines? I'll try to repeat any question that you might have for the benefit of somebody who's watching on the internet. So, Fred? Yeah, one, one thing I've been thinking about, you, you know, we've talked a lot about the multiplicity of copies and so forth through the, through the ages, I guess is a word we could use. Uh, um, and thinking back over the last century, uh, how, the, how that multiplicity of copies through the printed word now uh, has shifted from the uh, traditional text to the over to the the, the newer you know the the new translation text critical text and uh, thinking if the Lord tarries another uh, half century or whatever I mean half a uh, millennium or whatever, uh, how th this period would be looked back upon in, in that in that light. I mean, because uh, he's promised to preserve his word from generation to generation and so on. And this. So it's a so it's, it's, is it more of a question or more of like a statement? Or are you asking me to well, like forecast? Kind of, kind of both. I mean. Uh, uh, I, I mean, it's a reality that we have, you know, that's there in front of us. I, I uh, <clears throat> grew up, you know, uh, in the ministry with Word of Life for a period of time from uh, 1970 up through in, into the 90s. And uh, um, during that period of time, at the beginning, almost every pastor and church and everyone I was working with was King James and by the end of that period most of them had Alright, so I've got a better I think a little bit better handle on kind of what you're asking me so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about it sort of in a general sense and then I'll talk about it a little bit more specifically about what I think happened uh -huh. okay First of all, 
if, if you think about the, the history of the dispensation of grace, and specifically the, the history of the dispensation of grace, specifically as it relates to the issue of the transmission of the text, okay, you have, you have essentially two fundamental periods, okay? And I haven't really said it this way yet, and I, I, I've been meaning to and just haven't gotten there. You have what I'm calling the manuscript period, okay? The manuscript period is characterized by handwritten copies and handwritten translations, right? So anything that's happening, and this, this would really be from the first century all the way till the printing press in roughly 1455. Okay, so you have, you have this whole manuscript period where things are being done by hand, right? So any translation, any copying of the text, anything that's going on is going to be hand what? It's going to be handwritten, okay? Because the technology doesn't exist yet to mass produce something in print, okay? Now that's going to change in 1455 when we entered the period of the printed text. Okay, the printed text is going to come into existence, and I'm just using this. Historians argue about when Gutenberg actually really invented this thing, so I'm just using sort of the accept upon accepted date there, 1455. When 1455 comes, it's going to be a game changer in the history of the transmission of the text, because now instead of things being done in handwritten form and copies. Things, these handwritten things are going to start to be stated in printed form, okay, through text. So the first Bible that is printed is a Gutenberg Bible, and the Gutenberg Bible is a is basically a Latin Vulgate. It's a basically a printed edition of the Latin Vulgate on a printing press, okay. The first Greek New Testament is going to come um, because because of the work of Erasmus in 1516. So this is going to be really the first printed edition of the Greek New Testament is going to be the work of Erasmus in 1516. Now that is going to get refined um, by the Elzevir brothers, by Biza, by others, right? And then eventually, and then, so this is going to touch off in English a series of translations. Now I could look up the dates uh, easily enough, but I'm going to go from memory, okay? The first guy to do it is Tyndall. Siri is a wonderful thing, is she not? Okay. The first guy to do it in English is Tyndall. Okay. Tyndall's going to do it in 1526. What do you do? What do you do? I have the dumb thing on uh, mute, so whatever. So Tyndall's going to be the first one in English in 1526, 1525, 1526. Okay. After him, it's going to be Coverdale. After Coverdale, it's going to be the Matthews Bible. After that, it's going to be the Great Bible. Then the Geneva Bible. Then the Bishop's Bible. And then eventually, the King James, or the authorized version, okay, is going to be in 1611. So my point in showing you this, and I'm going to move this just a little bit, okay, my point in trying to show you this is the manuscript, so most of the history of the dispensation of grace is going to fall into that time period, okay? It's only been the last, what, five or six hundred years that we've seen a shift away from handwritten copies to what? Printed editions, right? And so uh, once a printed text is established, once the printed form of the Greek New Testament is established, and this printed form of the Greek New Testament is representative of the Byzantine majority that we've been talking about in class, then there's going to be a series of English translations that are going to occur all the way through to the King James in 1611, okay? Now, from that point on, there are, you got to be careful how I say this, there are a few translations of the Bible that are made. Most of them are made by what I would consider to be doctrinally aberrant groups like the Unitarians, okay? People who are trying to diminish the deity of Christ, people who are trying to do those kinds of things, right? There are others in America, most notably Noah Webster is going to make his own translation of the Bible somewhere in the, the late, 15, late 1820s, early 1830s. But there is no major revision of the King James until 1881. So for nearly 300 years, 
this text is going to hold sway over the English-speaking world as the Word of God. Okay? Um, now, we already know that in 1881, they do not revise the King James. This is not a revision of the King James. This is an entirely new translation based upon a new what? Greek. A new Greek text. Okay? This Greek text is the text of Westcott Hort, or the critical text, is going to come out in this time period, and it's going to give us the 1881 revision. Okay? Now, to Fred's point, these new versions, then in like 1901, you're going to have like the American Standard, and then there's going to be a bunch of other ones that are coming. Most of these new translations do not really get a foothold in the greater body of Christ until after World War II. Okay? After World War II, there is a movement in the United States called the Neo-Evangelical Movement. This would be Billy Graham. This would be the guys out of Fuller Theological Seminary in, in uh, California that are starting a new movement to, quote, revise fundamentalism. We studied all the stuff when we went through the Grace History Project. So what happens, Fred, is after World War II, throughout the 1950s and 1960s and into the 1970s, the body of Christ in America begins for the first time in large to lay aside the traditional translation in English for modern versions. Okay? And this is when you start to see a, an upswing in King James only literature. If you look at the it, it, historians talk about what they call um, historiography. You ever heard that word before? Mm, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> historiography is the study of how history has been written. Okay? So you could, you could pick up every history book that you pick up, whether it's church history, whether it's secular history, political history, military history, whatever it is, is written from a particular point of view. Okay? Uh, when I was doing my undergraduate work at Cornerstone University, I wrote a, we had to write a, histori a historiographical paper. And I picked mine on the history of the Reagan administration. So my paper was not about the history of the Reagan administration. My paper was on the history of the written works about the Reagan administration. Okay? So when Reagan is in office, a bunch of people are writing from a certain point of view about Reagan. Ten years after Reagan's been out of office, a bunch of books are written from a different point of view about who? Reagan. So historiography is about studying that, right? If you study the historiography of the King James-only literature, it's, it really starts to come off the press in the late 1950s and early 1960s, and then really in heavy fashion in the 1970s. So what Fred is talking about, and what Fred is observing, Fred just said, I go back to my early days with Word of Life in the 1970s, and we were all using the King James, okay? That was my experience with Awana in the 1980s as a kid. When I went to Awana in the 1980s as a kid, the only Awana books you can buy were in what? King James. King James. Now, if you go to Awana, you have your pick of any old version you want. Awana will print a book for you in that version, right? So this has been a slow transition in specifically American culture to the adopting and the readily using and the replacing and common use of the traditional King James Bible. This did not happen overnight. This happened over a long period of time, okay? Which is why there are many, there's a church uh, down, in, down the road in Lansing that runs a ministry called Local Church Bible Publishers where their full, their, their main, fo one of their main focuses as a church is to keep the traditional English Bible in print and to sell it from their ministry as part of what they're doing. So I think that, and a lot of that too, Fred, is based upon the perception that the Word of God ought not be in the hands of profiteering organizations, but that the Word of God ought to be in the hands of the everyday, common, believing body of Christ. Okay? So I would say that preservation is actively occurring 
as groups are seeking to preserve this in English and still print it with fidelity today in the 21st century. So that's sort of a long sort of rambled history of some things, but I think it's at least somewhat helpful. Do you, and do you have a follow-up, Fred? Yeah, you, uh, one of the points you made a um, few weeks ago was that um, Satan is at work to <clears throat> counterfeit yes. the Word of God, and but one of the, one, one of the uh, good points, I guess, was that the, that the multiplicity of copies uh, supported the the uh, authorized text, where the uh, Minority of copies supported the the corrupted text. I guess yeah. Say. So um, there, is the the most by far, the statistics are overwhelming. The most widely printed book and most widely printed, distributed, and read book in all of human history is a King James Bible. The the statistics. I don't know. I don't have them memorized, but I've seen them in the past. The statistics are overwhelming that. There are millions and millions and millions of copies of the King James Bible out there worldwide. Far and away the most of, out of anything that, it, that we have uh, in printed English. So it would be extremely hard for the adversary to, to snuff out that witness, which is why the tactics have changed, right? The tactics have changed to, to, to put alongside of this a competing authority and then make men the authority to decide and determine what is the word of God and what isn't. Okay, and that's really what and that's really what's been going on. We've seen that start to happen in the 1600s. It gained steam through the 1700s, through the 1800s, and then eventually it comes to a point where it culminates in Great Britain with this movement right here and the publication of the RV, the Revised Version, in 1881. That does not immediately follow suit in America. Okay? It takes its time to matriculate down throughout the believing church in America. And it's probably about the 1980s that all of this starts to come to a head in America about 100 years after it did it in Britain. Yeah. Even in secular terms, there's this saying, you might have heard it, that America is about 75 to 80 years behind Europe. So if you think about the European states, their embrace of socialism, for example, and when they did that after World War II and so forth, and us now seemingly heading that way, or at least that some people think so, I'm not, it's not my point of this lesson to make a point about that, but there seems to be a, a lag between what American culture is willing to accept and what European culture is willing to accept that roughly equates to about 75 years. Well, that same thing happened with this. Okay, the first, the first, there were some books printed in nine, the reason I have 1956 up here is this is the date of Edward F. Hills, the King James Version defendant. The King James Version was defended was published in 1956 by Edward F. Hills. Okay, before that, there were a few books. Uh, there, there was a book by a guy who we'll talk about in the eight, in the 1930s by uh, Benjamin Wilkinson. There was a book in the 1920s by a guy named Philip Morrow that were supporting the traditional texts and the, and the traditional English Bible against the, um, the critical text and the modern versions. So it was there, there were people discussing it, but it had not reached the sort of critical mass that it's going to in this time period here and into the 80s. Okay. Anybody have a question or comment about that? Yes? I'm just curious, going on from what Fred was talking about, how you went from the handwritten text to the printed text. Now we're going into... The electronic text? Digital, yeah. Yeah. With God promising to preserve his word, what kind of a text do you suppose may come with that? I think, from what I've seen, um, maybe I'm old school, but unless I'm doing... Research. I always prefer to read out of a, a, a printed Bible, okay? Um, 
Most of what I've seen has been that the digital, um, the digital editions of Bibles have been faithful to the printed editions of Bibles. Now, especially with modern versions, because modern versions, you have to remember, have copyrights on them. Okay? So, for example, there's a, I think it's Crossway, I might be wrong, but Crossway owns the publication rights to the ESV. Zondervan owns the publication rights to the NIV. Other pub, and, and so they cannot, if I want to make a digital thing, I can't just change those things without being subject to copyright violation and infringement. Now let me just say this. A lot of King James advocates will say that the King James Bible is the only Bible that's never been copyrighted. I don't think that's entirely true, as I talked about in my paper on the King James Bible in America. The King James Bible was printed in Great Britain through right of privilege invested in the crown. So the crown would grant somebody the right to print the text, okay? And there, in, in all of his, the history of Great Britain, in, in all the history of Great Britain, there's only been like four, maybe five places that have ever had privilege to print the text. So if you have a Cambridge Bible, I don't know if any of you have a Cambridge Bible in front of you, but if you open it up and look at the front page, it will say in Latin, cum, C-U-M, privilegio, meaning with privilege. So Cambridge University was granted the privilege of printing the text by the crown. And therefore, they're able to do that. The only place that the King James is not governed by the right of privilege to print. Now, in, in British law, that's a little bit different thing than our copyright in the United States. Okay, It's, it's, it's not quite the same thing. But the crown, in, in, in lands controlled by the British crown, the crown has the right and authority to determine who will or will not print the text. Okay? In jurisdiction, out, in the English-speaking world outside of the authority of the crown, like America, that the, the text is basically in the public domain and people can print it and do whatever they want with the King James text I'm talking about. Okay, Which is why, going all the way back to the 1790s, when you see the King James first starting to be printed in the New World, they already started to adopt the spelling from traditional British spellings to Americanized spelling. These Americans were spelling words differently in, 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 in America by the time subsequent to the revolution than their British counterparts were across the pond. And so when they started printing the text in America from the first generations of printing, they started to Americanize the spellings in the text, okay? So all that is also covered in my paper, The King James Bible in America. But it's real fascinating because the colonists did not view themselves as having the right to print the text. The crown did not want these backwards country bumpkins in the New World printing the text. So all Bibles were imported to the New World until during the Revolution when the first one was printed. Okay, And even then, it was a, the, the cost was so astronomical it nearly bankrupt the guy who did it. Uh, our, uh, Robert, um, his last name escapes me at the moment. But yeah, there, so I don't know what's happening. I think the, the, in the digital world, um, I think is still largely subject to whatever, especially when it comes to new versions, it's largely subject to um, whatever those copyrights are. Because if, they, if people creating digital platforms change those texts, they would be subject to copyright infringement. Okay, so whether that's good, bad, right, wrong, or indifferent, that's the reality. Okay, and I think it would be difficult for somebody to... Um, now, King James advocates differ about this kind of thing. Okay, um, and, 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 and sometimes strongly so over the spelling of words. Okay, so they'll, they'll make big deals about the spelling of words like Savior. That's the British spelling. Yeah. O-U-R. O-U-R. Same with labor. Same with labor, same with a lot of words, right? But in America, we spell that word what? 
We don't spell with the U. Does that mean it's a wholly different word with a different meaning? I would say to you, no. Now, there are some King James advocates who will say that's a corruption of the text. Now, for me, that is a different way of saying the same thing. That is simply a matter of orthography about how you're going to spell the word. It is not an outright corruption of the text. Okay. Now, where things get a lot more hairy is when you start talking about like how you're going to spell Holy Spirit or Spirit. You're going to spell it like that. Or are you going to spell it like that? Are you going to spell it with caps? Yep. Referring to the person of the Holy Spirit? Or are you going to spell it like this? Now this to me is a, it, this is a, a potential <coughs> problem. Okay, But stuff like this, uh, to, to me that's neither here nor there. This is the kind of stuff that started happening as soon as, nearly as soon as the text started to be printed in America. Words started to be printed with these American spellings. So if, I'm sure these guys will tell you when they read the notes. I'm so used to reading a King James that when I type stuff, I'll type it like that. Not because I'm trying to be like super holy or something. Just because that's the way I, I typed it, right? Sylvia, do you have a question? Could somebody copyright the King James no, not 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 the text as it exists in in Britain. No. Is the revised King James copyrighted? The new King James is copyrighted by Thomas Nelson. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of any modern revised versions that are based on the same manuscript as the King James? There's some things out there called the King James 2000. It was done in the year 2000 that basically takes the the King James text and, and makes some further orth orthographical changes to spelling and stuff like that. Um, there's um, the New Cambridge Paragraph Bible that was done by David Norton. Um, there's now what he was trying to do though was different. He was trying to set the text the way the translators originally intended it for it to be set. So that's a sort of a whole different thing, and a lot of King James advocates don't understand what Norton was trying to do. They automatically criticize him and they don't bother to read what he said he was trying to do and go through his explanation. It was really a fascinating thing, uh, what Norton was trying to accomplish with the new Cambridge Paragraph Bible. There's another one I have at home, something like the Third Millennium Bible or something like that. But I haven't looked at any of those with any amount of diligence to be able to say whether they're... Um, different ways of saying the same thing or whether they include substantive differences in meaning. So it's, it's not just that these modern versions are based on different manuscripts. They're, the English revision is actually different. I mean, yes. it's written in a way, they say, to make it easier to read, to get away from the archaic uh, English of the King James. And uh, so, you know, that that's a major factor besides the different manuscripts. So you have, yeah, you have a textual issue, right. which to, which is the main issue, the text that they're coming from, right. okay? That's the main issue, but then you also have the philosophy of translation and other things that you got to keep in mind. Go to John 3, just as a, I've used this example before, but, so, a lot of people complain about the King James use of the word ye. Uh, you know, and, and so what John 3 this is, I'm, I'm just going there because this is an easy example um, you take the word you or ye what's the difference? singular and plural what's that? singular and plural singular and plural Okay, so the, the word you, I could say, you should really read your Bible. Who am I, who am I talking to? Uh -huh. What? Uh -huh. I'm talking to all you guys. You all. Y'all. <laughs> you should really read your Bible. Or I, could, or I could look at Mike over here and I could say, you should really read your Bible. Same word could have a singular meaning and application 
or a what? Plural. Plural meaning and application. Okay? Now what about that word? That word is more precise because it only refers to who? Ye. Plural. plural. Ye is plural. Look at John 3. Verse 1. There was, a, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. So the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto who? Thee. Thee. Who's that? Him. That's him. That's Nicodemus. Okay? Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. I marvel, um, sorry, marvel not that I say unto who? Thee. What's the next word? Ye. ye. Who's that? Nicodemus. That's Nicodemus and all of the rest of the house of Israel. Okay? Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. So what, what Jesus is saying there, not only does it apply specifically to Nicodemus, it applies to what? The entire nation of Israel. So Mike, when you go removing this ye out of there to make it easier to read, what you've done is you've, re you've stricken the accuracy of the text out of the, and, and, and potentially substantively altered the meaning of the text. Amen. Or at least made it way more difficult to get what's really going on here. This is a dispensational issue in this chapter. This is Jesus talking to a leader in Israel, Nicodemus, telling him what, not only what he, but what the entire nation needs. And that's to be born what? To be born again. Okay? So, any other... Did, did you have any more, Sylvia? Well, I just wanted to emphasize that that's an important factor, the uh, actual translation. Yes, the, the actual translation, the philosophy of translation, and what you're thinking you're accomplishing when you translate is, is important, as is this textual issue. What are we going to translate? So the reason why whole verses are missing is not a translation issue, that's a text issue. You can't translate verses that aren't in the text. Okay. Craig? Okay, so on what Mike and Fred said here, as we've been talking and going through all of these lessons, um, the thing that it causes me to think about more and more is, yea, hath God said, and the authority of Scripture, what the Protestants, what they taught, what they believed, and to compare that to what we're seeing now, and sorry, just stick with me here for a second. So, the issues of the text remind me of how important it is for us to know what God actually said. Because the modern translations don't say the same thing as the King James Bible. So, what can happen there? What have we seen happen there? And is it as they, the textual critics, would say, well, no fundamental doctrines change. It's, it, everything's fine. You get to you know, you can read from the New Living Translation. Our church reads from all, you can bring in whatever Bible you want. We don't tell people, and this is literally stuff I've talked to pastors about, they've said, we don't tell people what kind of Bible to bring in here. You can bring whatever Bible you want into this church. But what happens when I start reading from Scripture, or what I think is Scripture, and it's not Scripture? And then as I've studied this, I look back at the things that have happened and the text that these men adhered to, such as the Jehovah's Witnesses, the, uh, I don't remember, the, the man that founded the Mormon Church. But, Joseph Smith. Right, okay. So, 
I'm going to use Kenneth Hagin as an example here. I used to listen to Kenneth Hagin, and when he, I heard him say that the Lord Jesus Christ visited him personally, I had a sharp pain in my gut. Like, it scared me. Like, there was something there that was like, whoa, wait a second, that's not right. And, I mean, it was, it was a, if you want to call it a check in my spirit, that's what happened. But I kept listening to him because, you know, there's, and this was, you know, a few years ago I was listening to this man. I did some recent investigation as to what Kenneth Hagin actually has said there regarding what the Lord Jesus Christ talked to him about when he was visited. And then what I think now is, should I just listen to that and, and look at what this man does, or should I take it to Scripture? And when I take it to Scripture, and the things, and not to go into quoting him and everything here, but when I look at the things that these men have done and said, it doesn't line up with Scripture. And then I see the perversions that have happened in these things. I, that, that, I mean, we can go on all day about what Jehovah's Witnesses believe, what the Mormons believe, and what Kenneth Hagin was taught, and what he claimed that the Lord Jesus told him personally, but it doesn't line up with Scripture. And what that fundamentally tells me is that the Lord would never contradict his word. So who was Kenneth Hagin talking to? Who appeared to him? And then last night, I was reading an article here, and if we go to 2 Corinthians 11, uh, 13, it says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And verse 14 says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So, here's the thing. Does it change any doctrine? Well, they like to say no, it doesn't. And nothing, you're fine. You can read from this text. There's no, none of the fundamental doctrines are changed. You can read from these Bibles. But that's not what's happened. Well, we've showed that, right? Yeah. So. <coughs> Sorry, that was a lot, but. Is there a yeah, was there... well, it's, it's not necessarily a question, but like okay. you said, we like to discuss some of these things. This is just my personal, you know, uh, viewpoint on this now. But to me, that's that's terrifying. So that's when I was scary stuff. When I was growing up in the eighties, eighties, <coughs> the Christians, the evangelical Christian community, was all bent out of shape about the Smurfs, the Care Bears. Rainbow Bright, My Little Pony, and Star Wars. Okay, now there may be things in those that is maybe not good. Okay, then in the 90s, they were bent out of shape about Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings and all this stuff, right? Meanwhile, right under their noses, the adversary is sneaking in false texts and and getting them to buy that as they are as the scripture as the word of truth and then getting them to subscribe to this idea that well not so they're, they're all focused on all this stuff out here on all this superfluous the care bears and harry potter and all this sort of stuff meanwhile the the real attack on the body of christ is all is, is underway within the church to undermine the authority of the word of god right okay and to cause Christians to doubt whether or not what they have in front of them is really what God said. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, I've said this last week, and I'll say it probably again. Okay? The adversary knows what he's doing, right? He, if he can get you to think that, oh, this is all the same, and it doesn't matter, and no doctrines change, and so on and so forth, then will he try to do that? Mm -hmm. Seems to me that he will. Seems to me that he has. Seems to me that we've already demonstrated that. Okay? So... Yeah, I, I think that we that the evangelical Christian community, by and large, is almost always focused on the wrong stuff. Now, I don't mean that we should support abortion. I don't mean that we should, you know, support evil and, and things that are obviously the violations of God's word. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is they're all worried about that stuff when the real thing they need to be worried about is what's happening in their midst right. that they're not aware is going on or they're not sure about. Okay, Blake, you had your, a question a minute ago. Well, it was just uh, with the you and ye and all that for a version on what came out. It was I actually have that as great comfort, way of the masters. 
version, they change the D's and the Ds and the Y's, and they change it to what they're, you would read them as. So, there is a version, I don't know if it's Holman, I think it's Holman Publishing, that it publishes theirs. Now, I want to say... I mean, that's the only thing they've changed, and that's so it's easier to read, I guess, is what they say. I want to make sure I say something else. I, look, the question of what Bible somebody uses is a very personal issue. Okay? Um... And when I was in Bible college, you know, I made some mistakes on this and how I dealt with people on this issue. And we got to be careful about that. But just be, but but in a, in an in effort to try to speak the truth and love about this, which is the attitude I really think you need to try to do this out of, you also have to be willing to tell people the reality of what is going on. Okay, they're different. They don't mean the same thing. They're not teaching the same things. And all you have to do is know a little bit about logic to know that, right? If, if this says one thing and this says something else, they both can't be what? Right. They both can't be right. So that means one's right and one's wrong. Now, there, again, when I'm saying that, I'm saying in a substantive sense, not in a sense of exact identicality or verbatim identicality. I think we've settled that issue, right? So that, that seems to me to be a fundamental thing. And then you get into... Um, Bible study and church fellowship and so on and so forth and everyone has a different version of what God's word is and it really makes for hard sledding if you're trying to do any ministry because you have to you're always budding and running into well mine doesn't say that and mine says this and then there's this question of well what what's really the authority here the the text in front of us or the guy standing in front of everybody telling them what it means Okay. And that's what the new translations do, is they put that authority in your hands, not the scripture's hands. That's what the adversary has always wanted. That's the way he tempts Eve, right? He tempts Eve and he says, he basically says to Eve, well, God doesn't want you to do this because God knows that if you do this, you'll be like the gods and you'll know what? Good for me. So he, he gets Eve to think that God's somehow holding out on her. That he hasn't really been good to Eve. That he hasn't really told Eve all that Eve needs to know. And once that doubt comes in, she what? And then Adam, he just follows her. Okay? All right, Amy, I thought you had your hand, your hand up. Um, I don't know how this plays into it, but what about the, I don't know if this is new either, um, the Hebrew roots movement? I'm starting to see that more and more on the internet and social media. You know, for example, not calling Jesus Jesus, but calling him Yeshua mm -hmm. and this kind of thing. To me, to, for me personally, as I've observed that, I think that's exactly what Paul's talking about in the pastoral epistles when he talks about foolish questions and about genealogies. And he says, avoid it. Um, because that... that I don't think that leads to anywhere good either. I don't think that's necessarily a textual translational issue, but it's definitely a movement that is picking up steam out there along with some other thought processes. Mm -hmm. But I don't put any personally put any stock in it. So you think that it might fizzle out? <laughs> Maybe. I mean, it, it'll either fizzle out or it'll... <coughs> The, the people that want to follow it will latch on to it and stick with it, and the people that don't won't, and it'll just end up to be another subset of evangelical Christianity. Mm -hmm. I guess one thing related to something that Craig was saying about the Jehovah's Witnesses is when you're talking with one of them, they like to take and quote things from different versions in order to... Yep. Are you, you know, what the truth is, according to them? And they are trained to do that. Yes. They will pick and choose from the Bible smorgasbord the ones that they think fit the points they're trying to make. Whose authority are they following when they do that? And the, I've dealt with them many times at my own house and had them, you know, do that to me or try to do that to me. <coughs> So, anybody with any other questions generally? Yeah. This is, this is probably a more simple question for you, but um, taking the uh, 
let's say we're comparing the King James with, well, I'll pick on the NIV because it's pretty controversial. Okay. And I guess, in your opinion, I'm wondering, what do you uh, feel is lost as far as um, just uh, God's plan of salvation and redemption? Probably a two-part question. And also, uh, our, uh, who we are, who we are as Christ followers, related to that. Okay. Excuse me. Um, I just, I guess I want, I want to know what you feel is the mostly, mostly lost between the two. So I can give you, so again, going off the top of my head, okay, um, First, I'd go to first. I'd go to Colossians chapter one, verse fourteen. I'm gonna open, turn this on and look at a couple things. Colossians chapter 1, verse 14, while I wait for this, it says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So I guess I would ask the question the following way, Ken. Is faith in the is personal faith in the shed blood of Christ necessary for justification? Yeah. I Hebrews says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of what? Sins. The NIV and modern versions leave out through his blood from that verse. Okay? The reason they do it is because it's not in that critical text they're translating. Okay? So for me, that's a pretty important issue related to salvation. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are also some other ones. Okay? Um, I'm, I, where's the one, somebody else might be able to help me with this, where Paul talks about are saved... And the is that it? Everyone go there quick. You're talking about being saved? Yeah, yeah, yeah. First, first go to first Corinthians chapter one, verse eighteen. And of course this isn't cooperating. First Corinthians chapter one, verse eighteen. It says the King James says, For the preaching of the cross it's to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Notice the, the wording there says, are what? Saved. saved. So in other words, if you've trusted the preaching of the cross, are you saved? Yes. Past tense, done deal, over with. Once and for all time. Okay? The NIV reads the following here, Ken. It says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that... I'm making the appropriate change. It doesn't read exactly like that. But for the preaching of the cross is unto them perish foolishness, but unto us which are being saved, it is the power of God. Is there a difference between are saved and being saved? There's a big difference between done, past tense, done deal, over with, once and for all time, and, well, I'm still in the process of being what? Being saved. So that's an issue of that's an issue of where, where where Mike's point comes up about the interplay between text and translation. Okay? To me there's a there, there's there's a big difference between those two. Now we're not we're not a we're not a Baptist church, but go to Acts 8. Here's another one. In Israel's program This would be a big deal. It's verse 37 they leave out, right, Craig? <clears throat> so this is Philip talking to the Ethiopian eunuch in this passage. Verse 34, Acts 8, 34. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh this prophet, of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And said 
And uh, excuse me. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, "He see here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized?" And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they both went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. I skip verse thirty-seven. Why? Because the NIV leaves that verse out. But look at what verse 37 says. And Philip, and Philip said, so at the end of verse 36, the eunuch says, What doth hinder me to be baptized? In verse 37, and Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So in Israel's program, at that point, dispensationally, was that a pretty important thing to believe if you were going to be baptized? Statement of faith. So the, the, the critical text in modern versions remove verse 37 altogether. Now the New King James might have it and must have it in brackets. I just have it. Okay, it just has it. The NIV, ESV, others either have it in brackets with a footnote saying it shouldn't be there, or they just remove it altogether and put it in the footnote. Earlier editions of the NIV, literally, if you watch the numbering, they would go verse 36, verse 38. They would skip verse 37 altogether. There wasn't even a place for it in the numbering. So, yeah, I think these things are, I think these things are, subs, do, affect doctrine. Let's come to another one. Go to Galatians chapter 2. Here's a couple of just flat out dispensational ones that affect issues related to the gospel, at least this one. This is another issue I should add up with you know this, with King James only literature and teaching, is some King James only ad, some King James advocates are um, rightly dividing Pauline dispensationalists, and others are not, and so they don't they don't really like they, and so even within the King James camp, if you will, you've got subsets of people who are willing to say certain things and, and do certain things that others are not. And so that, that, that's an issue that also needs more clarity. But look at this, look at verse 6. Look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 6. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. So that's Paul talking about, he goes up there, okay, to the uh, uh, in Acts 15, he goes to the Jerusalem Council, and he, he's talking about how he went into those who were who seemed to be somewhat. But look at verse seven. So let me, let me, before we read verse seven, let's back up. Did Peter, James, and John add anything to Paul's understanding at the Jerusalem Council? No. No. Did Paul add something to their understanding? Yes. How do you know? Look at verse seven. But contrarywise. So verse 6 just said that those men up there at Jerusalem, they didn't teach Paul anything. Paul didn't already what? No. no. Verse 7, but contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. Now in your King James Bible there, how many, how many gospels are in that verse? Two. Two. There was a gospel that was committed to Peter for the circumcision for the nation of Israel, and there was a gospel that was committed to Paul for the uncircumcision for the Gentiles. Praise God. Okay? And Paul goes to that Jerusalem council meeting, and he tells them this, and he adds something to their understanding that they didn't want. Didn't know. Didn't know. But if you read that verse 7 in a modern version, it says, but contrary wise, when they saw the gospel to the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel to the circumcision was unto Peter. I, I, I can't even read it wrong. Can, can I ask what the New King James says on that verse? Um, verse 7. But on the contrary, they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcision was yes. to Peter. Okay, that's not super bad. The NIV is blatantly obvious in saying that those two are the same one. The same gospel. Okay. So to answer your question, this the difference is in English. First of all, the reason there are differences in English is for two reasons. 
Number one, because of the text basis is different. And number two, the, the, the approach to translation is different. Okay? But what you have in English in front of you does impact understanding, doctrinal understanding of, of how these verses are to be understood and taught and preached. Okay? Let me show you one more. Go to, go, go to Ephesians 3. I've made reference to this before. Uh, is this a quick comment, Craig? I want to add on to something there before you're done, please. Okay. <clears throat> now, one reason why dispensational theology is dying in America is because modern versions don't say dispensation. Mm -hmm. Verse 1. Ephesians 3 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given to me to you. King James identifies a specific dispensation of God committed to Paul called the dispensation of grace. Verse 3. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So this information pertaining to this dispensation of, of grace committed to Paul, that was a mystery. He can't find it in the Old Testament because it's first revealed to who? Paul, Paul right? Now look at verse 6. What is it? That the Gentiles should be heirs together with Israel. No. No. That's what the NIV says. The NIV says in verse 6 that the Gentiles should be heirs together with Israel. It, it basically is making a theological point that the body of Christ is spiritual Israel. Which is contrary to dispensational understanding of the scripture. So again, to me, yes, all this stuff matters a lot. Okay. Um, we got a few minutes. Craig, go ahead. Okay, so... Um... Okay, so the, the word dispensation being removed in, in verse 1. Uh, just kind of quick here. We've never been to a church that teaches, or have I ever heard a sermon in all the churches that I've been, and you know, we haven't been like bouncing around to a ton, but we used to go to United Methodist Church. I've been to many sermons, okay? throughout my years, and I've never heard anybody talk about what happened when Stephen was stoned. <coughs> so, to start from the word dispensation being removed, not only would that change some things there that you just discussed, but for me to know what the word dispensation means helps me to understand what the Bible's talking about there, that it's an administration. If that's gone, I'm not even going to go to look for what that word means in the first place. Now, the NIV says administration, okay, not so dispensation. But that is a much more generic word than a dispensation. But okay, go ahead. Some, some of them remove it, though, right? And some of them remove it. The NIV, the question, the original question that Ken asked was about the NIV. The NIV says okay. administration there, not dispensation. Okay, so here's, here's, here's what I was going to say. So if no fundamental doctrine is supposed to be changed, and I'm going to use Kenneth Hagin as an example, because this has really been hitting me like a ton of bricks over the past 24 hours. Uh, I'm going to, so play along with me, please. Is Jesus, where is, where is the Lord Jesus Christ right now? Seated at the right hand of God the Father in the heavenly places. Right. So for me to come, for me to say that he came down and visited me last night, is that going to contradict scripture? Yes. Okay, so... For me to understand what it meant when he, the Bible says that Stephen looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the Lord Jesus Christ standing at the right hand of God, for me to understand what that really means, and then for me to then say, well, the Lord Jesus Christ came to me and he was standing, I've now entered into a whole mess of stuff that is like, well, wait, what do you mean? Because the Bible says that he's seated at the right hand of God until his enemies are made his footstool. So, that... That's the kind of stuff that blows my mind. Like when you get into this, that those kinds of perversions have happened. There's people out there that say that they've actually had these things happen to them, and that they think that it's the Lord appearing to them personally, and that, that 
stuff to me seems very scary. Which is why Colossians 2.18 matters. Go to Colossians 2.18. This is a verse in the Pauline scripture that talks about the relationship of the body of Christ with angelic beings during the dispensation of grace. Notice what it says. Let no man beguile you of your reward. How? In voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. Well, the angel came to my bedside last night and told me you all need to give me 20 bucks. Is that kind of stuff said a lot, all the time in preaching? Mm -hmm. Okay? What's the verse say? Intruding. So anyone that says that, number one, is an intruder. Do you want intruders in your house? No. Do you want intruders in your doctrine? No. Okay? Intruding into those things which he hath seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. The NIV reads in that verse, has seen. But it's not changed it's, the fundamental doctrine. It states the exact content opposite of what that verse says in verse 18 in the King James Bible. This verse says that the guy that tells you that doesn't know what he's talking about and is vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind and he's claiming to have seen things that he hasn't really what? Seen. Therefore, let no man beguile you. Don't let somebody come along claiming this stuff deceive you is what Paul's saying. Right? Because they're talking about stuff that they don't really know what they're talking about. They're claiming things that aren't what? Aren't true. That aren't so. Okay? So, we're at 10 o'clock and uh, we made it through a Q&A without me having to have any notes. Um, hopefully, uh, I, I think we covered a lot of ground here on a lot of different stuff. Um, it's my hope and intention that at some point in this class, I want to teach a lot more specifically on some of this stuff and how some of these things, phenomenon, actually developed uh, historically within the uh, dispensation of grace. And again, I, I have to confess that I'm somewhat of a nerd, that I've actually taken these books and laid them out on the table in front of me in the order they were written and read them in their chronological order to see what's really going on here with this thought stream. And when you do that, it is absolutely fascinating how once something gets stated uh, by a King James advocate, it is almost always repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated, oftentimes without a critical analysis. It just sort of becomes the gospel, if you will, on that without anybody actually fact-checking it or looking into it or doing any research to see whether or not it's true, okay? But there's a lot of things that are happening here, and what, what you need to do is take, not what you need to do, what I've done and what I'm going to try to talk to you about is to take this stuff and talk to you about the order in which this stuff was written and lay that stuff out on the table so you can see the thought development within this movement, okay, and how it got to where it is now. Not everything... I can appreciate people that start with the right presuppositions. I can appreciate people that end up in the right spot. But that doesn't mean that everything they've said along the way is helpful, beneficial, accurate, or true. So we need to make sure that what we're saying is actually the case and not just something that we want to believe because it suits the narrative that we're trying to advance. Okay? But we've got to quit. So thanks for your attention.